there's a light that glows by the front door. Don't forget the keys under the mat. When childhood stars shine, always stay humble and kind. Go to church cause your mom says to visit grandpa every chance that you can. It won't be wasted time, always stay humble and kind. Between sleeping with someone and sleeping with someone you love, I love you ain't no pickup line, so always stay humble and kind. Hold the door, say please, say thank you. Don't steal, don't cheat, don't lie. I know you got mountains to climb. Shut off the AC and roll the windows down. Let that summer sun shine. Always stay humble and kind. Don't take for granted the love this life gives you. When you get where you're going, don't forget to turn back around. And help the next one in line. Always stay humble and kind. And now the end is near, and so I face. Final curtain, my friend. I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I traveled each and every highway and more. Much more than this, I did it my way. Regrets, I've had a few, 
But then again, too few to mention, I did what I had to do, and saw it through without exemption. I planned each charted course, each careful step along the byway, and more, much more than this, I did it my way. Yes, there were times, I'm sure you knew. It off more than I could chew, but through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. I faced it all, and I stood tall and did it. I feel my share of losing And now as tears subside I find it all so amusing To think I did all that And may I say Not in a shy way Oh no, oh no, not me, I did it my way, for what is a man, what has he got, if not himself, then he has not.
We on, Scott? Okay, I've got it on, I think. Do I? Excuse me while we do a little logistics. Okay, we're good. JR, where are you? Come on up. So we're here in a church that's John's church and Wendy's church and the kids' church. We're also here with Pastor Rob Douglas because they also attended Light Shine, which is an affiliated church with us. So we're welcoming you on behalf both of Westminster Presbyterian Church and Light Shine Presbyterian Church. And it's appropriate that we're here. This is where they worshipped. This is how they worshipped. We're going to do a few things that are a little bit different. But it's important that we know that we come to celebrate not just John's life, but the Lord of life, and to worship together. So let's listen to these words of Scripture. Our help is the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. For I was dead and now I am alive forevermore. And because I live, you shall live also. And because our hope is the name of the Lord, we come to celebrate the life of John Newhouse. To give thanks for the gifts of life that he gave and to celebrate the Lord's grace to us all. Let's pray. Father, you know we come. Sometimes it's hard to be here, but we can be in no other place. We pray your grace as we worship together, and as we remember, and as we laugh and we cry together. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. With you by my side, everything in the world seems better. Good things are twice as much fun because when I share them with you, I get to see you smile. Bad things are only half as bad because I know I can count on you to help me through them. With you holding my hand, I know that I have someone who sees life a lot like I do. Someone who shares the same values, dreams the same dreams. I know that I have someone who understands the parts of me that other people don't even know exist. With you in my life, I know I have everything anyone could ever want. Someone who's understanding and supportive, who's fun and interesting. Someone I love, who happens to be my best friend. A reflection from John of Damascus. Truly terrible is the mystery of death. I lament at the sight of the beauty created for us in the image of God, which lies now in the grave, without shape, without glory, without consideration. What is this mystery that surrounds us? Why are we delivered up to decay? Why are we bound to death? And Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 11. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. 
What gain have workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done from beginning to the end. There are so many different aspects of our lives. So we're going to ask four individuals to come just very briefly, give you a little piece of how they saw John, and the hopes that that will help you remember some ways in which you experienced him as well. So we're going to ask Ron Yasmashiro if he will come up and share with us a few thoughts. Ron? Not too brief. Um, this is the best I could do as far as red, USC red, but I can wear a Dodger blue all day long. <laughs> um, my glasses. I didn't know it was going to be first up. Okay, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. If there was one word that described John, it would be humble. He never looked down on anyone, never thought highly of himself was always confident of decisions, and possessed strength under control. I never heard him use profanity. I never saw him get angry. The only thing that I saw stunned impression was, whether good or bad, that I got from him was, oh, gosh. Most importantly, John was always willing to lend a hand to those in need and took credit, and never took credit when it was due to him. I'm Ron Yamashiro, Rotarian, fellow Rotarian and friend of John. John joined the family of Rotary back in June 2009. He joined our club, the Rotary Club of Westlake Village Sunrise, and quickly immersed himself with these humble characteristics in our club activities. Our Rotary, our club, is a general service organization that gives back to the community and to the world. Well, when he joined the club, one of the first committees he joined was the golf committee that holds the, um, that works with the, our annual golf tournament fundraising. And it was at that point that I knew that I'd, I love John because not only did he was an SC fan, he loved SC but was aloof about UCLA. Not because he loved the Dodgers and loathed the Giants, but because he loved to play golf. So finally we had someone in the committee that loved golf as much as, as much as I did. From there, John was at the fourth one of our club. His second year in our club, he would become chair of the golf tournament, did such a fantastic job. He was club rookie of the year. He found his passion and ran the you know, golf tournament for the next five years. During this period, he, rose, he raised about 250000 in gross receipts and under $100,000 net that went to a lot of local and national charities. Um, he was also club president during this time. In the year fiscal year of June, July uh, 2013 to June 2014, he was a club president and he was the golf tournament chair. Two unbelievable hardworking positions in our club. Um, he also, during his presidency, very many successful fundraisers, um, incredible amounts donated to our Rhodey Foundation. He went to go see our work that was done in Honduras. He went to go see the kids that we helped out in the villages. They all gave him a big hug because they knew that he represented Rotary, and it brought tears to John's eyes. He just recently joined, I mean, he was recently assistant governor, uh, and he served as a mentor for not only our club president, but also for the local club presidents. John got his family involved with Rotary too. His, his wife, Wendy, and his son, Scott and John, came to our meetings and would help with events. Wendy hosted a lot of golf committee meetings. We certainly appreciate that. Um, and Wendy and John were involved in feeding the homeless, providing holiday presents for the children of low-income housing, and having holiday breakfast with hundreds of senior citizens. As you can see, John was very, very involved with our club, very involved, but without taking any credit. The impact that John has, has on Rotarians, you can tell, because there's a number of Rotarians here, past and present, you can tell by the pin that they're wearing um, that these are all Rotarians that dearly, um, dearly love John. In closing, what I'd like to do is get, you know, go back to a time when I last saw John. Um, we played golf at Moore Park Country Club. It was a beautiful Sunday afternoon. It was a little less than a month ago. 
And, um, you know, I love John because mainly during the eight years that I knew him, if I ever needed to go play golf, I'd call him up and he'd say, yeah, sure, no problem, let's go play. <laughs> so I really enjoyed that. But this particular afternoon, we were talking about our rotary lives, we were talking about our beautiful wives, we were talking about our wonderful kids, and our crappy golf. But as I noticed, like, there's a flaw in his swing, and, you know, I'm not one to give tips on golf, you know, on golf at all, because I kind of suck at golf, too. But um, I said, look at John, stand up, you know, just a little bit straighter, okay, just a little bit, just a little bit more, okay, now swing. And he swung, and the ball went straight down, and far as can be. And he turned around, and he gave me a smile, and he said, oh, gosh. <laughs> so, John, I know you're listening. You're welcome for the tip. I know you're going to be playing some great golf in heaven. Um, we know that it's your whole earth. We know that it's your world. And my fellow Rotarians and I were just so blessed to be just a small part of it. We know that you're humble and never ask for credit, but we're going to tell you right now that we want to all thank you from the bottom of our heart for what you did for our club. Not only were you a great Rotarian, but you're also a great friend. You will never be forgotten. You will certainly be missed. But some memories of you and your smile that will always remain in our heart. We love you, John. Thank you, Ron. Bob Segan. Bob, where are you? Hello, everybody. It's great to see so many of John's friends here today. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Bob Segan. And uh, it's really an honor to be here to uh, say a few words about it. my good friend and uh, your good friend, John. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the accomplishments that I've seen and uh, really celebrate a remarkable life that he lived. Um, Wendy and I joke with each other about my job as a seat filler for John. And that would be the person that sits next to John when there's an empty seat. And uh, I disagree. I consider myself more of a, a uh, like a specialist, like a relief pitcher or a, a pinch runner. And, uh, and I, I would do that for Wendy any day in any event. And it's really been a pleasure on my part to spend those times with John. Well, it was baseball that brought us all together. Uh, we first met my family in the, the new houses at a pizza joint after a baseball game when the kids were celebrating. And uh, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I might have to do that. Uh, John's son, Scott, spotted my son, Tim, and ran across the, the, uh, the area and wrapped his arms around him, gave him a big bear hug, and yelled, Tim! And I guess they were friends because my son's not the touchy-feely kind of guy. And it looked like somebody threw a bucket of ice water on his back. But he said, let me get my point here. He said it was okay because it was Scott. It was his friend from school. Well, John introduced myself and later... Uh, John drafted, Ke I'm sorry, Tim, uh, Tim, Tim on the team, along with Scott and another fellow, uh, Jeffrey. And that became the nucleus of a, a baseball team that John would take from uh, T-ball at the beginning all the way up through high school. And these boys played together. And what's remarkable is they played together without any major incidents any, any blow-ups or any of the things that the teams typically have. And it was really a tribute to the way John ran the, the group. Now, when I assembled all this data that I, that I got, I realized that if you put John's picture on the card that like came in today, and you put a summary of the statistics like a baseball card would have, it would read something like this to give you an idea of what the guy's done. This was all for the love of the game of baseball. John coached 14 years of pony baseball teams. 
He only had kids on 10 of those teams. The other four, uh, Scott and uh, one of the other boys, coached for a couple of years. And then uh, Jim and John hadn't had enough coaching, and they tried it for a couple more years. Couldn't get it out of their systems. It was just for the love of the game. Uh, So he coached uh, 14 seasons, uh, 168 players, 252 games. They won three pony championships. And I think there was a fourth in there that we forgot about. Uh, At the same time in his life, he's traveled from six to seven continents. Uh, Does anybody know which one he missed? Antarctica. And I think Greenland and Iceland were closed when he went by, so he he hadn't visited those yet either. Uh, Traveled to over 30 countries, attended around 200 Major League Baseball stadium games, and over the years since 1962, Uh, attended approximately 800 Dodger games. I feel I was with him on all the ones that went to extra innings because he never left early. Now, John loved to teach the rules of the game and let the boys play, let the boys play. What impressed me the most was his calm demeanor. When making decisions, he was as cool as a cucumber. When he got stressed out, or if he did, you wouldn't know it. And if there's a bad call, he never went over and criticized the empire. He might pull him aside and have a chat, but he would never over uh, see the the empire's decision. And uh, clarity is interested in seeing that the kids play hard, play fair and honor the integrity of the sport. And uh, as a coach, he would evaluate the players and give them primary and secondary positions. And if a player wanted to play another uh, position, he'd ask the coach. And the coach would say, when you're ready, when you're ready. And they'd give him extra practice and encourage them to, to take this challenge on. Well, one day there was a boy that said, I wanted to pitch. And every day he asked the coach, can I pitch today? And John would say, you have to show me you're ready. So they went to the bullpen, and the kid was on the edge. John thought, let me give the boy a chance. Well, Buck it out there. First of all, John said, get ready. I'm going to have you in the game today. I'm going to find a place to put you in. And luckily a position came up where the, they had a lead and they had plenty of uh, – you know, they had batters coming up. They let him pitch. Well, he had trouble getting two out of three or three three outs. And after he uh, he pitched and and really wasn't getting the ball over the plate, he called John out. And he said, "John, this is a lot harder than I thought." And he, he and John said, "No, no, no. You did fine." And and the boy went back. And John encouraged him, he continued to work on your pitching. You can do it. And the kid put the work in, and by the end of the year, he was getting opportunities to pitch in almost every game. And really instilling confidence in the boy that if he worked hard, uh, he can achieve anything. This was a good one. One player was struggling. He hadn't had a, hadn't had a hit all year. And naturally... And it was getting close to the end of the season. Uh, he was getting down on himself, and he was kind of sitting off by himself away from the other kids. And uh, John noticed that the kid wasn't having fun, and uh, he, he talked, talked about dro- dropping off the uh, I'm sorry, dropping off the team. Well, John sat down with him and had a talk. And although I don't know what he said, um, when the boy came back and the team got together. Uh, they really rallied around this kid. They cheered him when he was in the in the game hitting. They cheered him in the batting cage. And it took a couple of games, but sure enough, the kid came through and he got a hit. And he turned around to look at Coach John's expression. And he saw the entire team jumping up and down 
yelling, run. <laughs> and uh, the kid luckily made it to first base. And when he turned around, he had the biggest smile on his face you could ever imagine. And uh, I, I will see that face again. Well, John coached all levels, from T-ball, which is kindergarten, all the way up through high school. And uh, when the boys graduated, they, were, they weren't ready to quit coaching. And uh, lucky for me and my family, uh, uh, John and Jim and Jeff and uh, who did I miss? Scott, oh, I miss Scott, decided that they wanted to volunteer. And even though they didn't have a child on the team, they were going to coach something that was unheard of, I guess. And they did that for a couple of years, and the boys got the experience and um, uh, really uh, learned how to uh, control a group of kids. And then uh, I think your dad and Jim stayed on for another two years because they hadn't had enough. So here's two, two, two men. Uh, they spent 10 years coaching their own kids and then four years coaching the other kids for the love of the game. Well, when, when John finally stepped back from coaching, uh, the league would call him. John, would you come back? We have uh, an opening. We need good coaches. And uh, I believe he coached uh, a basketball team one year when they couldn't find a coach. And uh, finally he... Uh, he retired. But one thing at the end uh, of each year, Lee would come back and say, will you come back next year? And they kept saying, we need good coaches. John's reply was, I'll check with Wendy to see if it's politically correct. And uh, of course, because it meant so much to John, the answer was always yes. Well, I'm going to move on to fishing. How am I doing on time? Speed, Speed it up. <laughs> so I'll wait for the hook, or um, I'll, I'll tell this at the reception. Uh, th- this one I like. It's really lighthearted, and it, uh, uh, it's about John. John and I talked about going fishing. And uh, John said he had a boat, and he said we could go up there and uh, catch fish and let's bring the wives up. And uh, when we, we decided to go fishing, I think you might have been there too, Don. We, we decided to go fishing and uh, got up early. And the women kind of made remarks that we, we won't see any fish tonight, but uh, we expect dinner. So we were going to bring fish or Chinese or something, I don't know. Well, the, uh, the rod John had was not in good condition, so I, I handed him mine. And I said, John, why don't you use this? I put some bait on, I threw it out. We had a good idea where the fish are, and uh, I turned away to get my secondary rod ready to go. All of a sudden, I heard John's rod going, zzz, zzz, and that's a sound that's a good sound. It's either you caught a fish or you snagged the bottom and the boat's drifting. And at the same time I heard that noise, John said, Bob, I think I have a fish. And I said, John, keep your tip up and keep tension on that line. And let me come around and check the drag. And the drag was good. And I said, John, don't touch this drag. If this fish wants to run, let it run. And uh, that happened about four times. It made four runs. Finally, we safely got it up to the boat into the net. And my goodness, it was the biggest fish I have ever seen. And I said, John, good job. And he says, that's the first fish I've ever caught. <laughs> and I said, John, that's bigger than any fish I've ever caught. As a matter of fact, it's bigger than two of the biggest fish I ever caught. It was huge. 
And he said, thank me for helping him. And I said, I thought you said you went fishing before. And he says, I did, but I never caught any. I saw the same smile on John's face that I saw on the first baseman's face. So... Thank you, Bob. So you want me to come back uh, tomorrow? No, but you can tell some stories in the Fellowship Center. I'll do that, guys. Okay, we have lots of stories. Okay, Kevin. Come on up. Thank you. John Newhouse was my best man. He was my best friend forever. John was everyone's best friend. He was my fraternity brother and a fraternity brother to many who are in this room. He was the kindest person I ever knew in my entire life. John Newhouse loved the world. And he was, as everyone knows, it's already been mentioned, he was a renowned traveler. My grandfather told me there were two places he never wanted to go. One was hell, and the other was Russia. John and I went back to the USSR during the height of the Cold War in 1981. More than a few thought we were crazy, and they were right. When one talked about going to the so-called evil empire, it was not to and from. It was in and out. John saw Moscow, what they called Leningrad at the time. The Baltic states is just another adventure. We did come out of Russia and we came back to America. John literally visited, okay, not Antarctica, but every continent on the planet. And he was always looking forward to his next road trip. I said, John, where are you going next? He always had the good answer for that question. Um, and you can say is that Wendy knows this fact oh so well about John's love for travel, and we saw the pictures of, I think, John and John, I think you were in Australia, if I was correct. Um, speaking about the world, we can say ex cathedra that the world is a better place because John was here in this world. When I started thinking about what I wanted to say here, you come to the realiz realization that the English language is just going to fail you. It's not going to, it's not going to rise up to the person. But I thought about the word that the U.S. Marine Corps uses as its motto. It's in Latin, Semper Fidelis or Semper Fi. It's translated, it means always faithful. There are many virtues about John but his passionate loyalty to the spirit of Troy, his devotion to his beloved Los Angeles Dodgers, his commitment to his fraternity bros, his service with his fellow Rotarians, but most importantly, his faithfulness to his family. Stand out when one contemplates what made John Newhouse just so special. John Jr. and Scott, let's face it, there were times times when you drove him insane. But nonetheless, he was always proud of you and literally, and told me so, would do anything in his power to make your lives the best that they possibly could be. Wendy, you are always a miracle in John's eyes. He was so proud to have you on his arm. He loved you dearly. 
and I can state with impunity, he was always Semper Fi when it came to you and your 33 years of marital bliss. He instinctively knew that he overachieved in marriage, and he, tre- and he treasured this union every day. And considering that we are celebrating the life of John Robert Newhouse in a house of God, there are lines of scripture that seem just right in depicting why John was a gift to all of us. They come from 1 Corinthians. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Trust me, that's John. It keeps no records of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. John, I love you. Your family loves you. Your wonderful spouse loves you. Everyone here will always love you. And on a personal note, as your best man, John, if I'm good enough to enter those pearly gates to join you in eternity, the first microbrew is on me. Thank you, Kevin. Doug Sutton? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Sutton. I've known John for 40 years. We, uh, we date back to the fall of 1975. We were both in the same pledge class at Phi Kappa Tau, the University of Southern California. And I'm honored to be here to talk about my good friend John. So when, Doc, when uh, Rick Rice uh, organized this, he said I had three hours, so I shouldn't be having any trouble. <laughs> Forty years, three hours, that ought to be okay. Oh, did you say three minutes? Sorry. Three minutes. So um, in the interest of time, I better get started. Uh, John had a great influence on my life over the years. There were so many stories involving, uh, involving John that shaped my life. It's very difficult to summarize, but I do want to uh, mention a couple of things that, that stand out. Uh, as, as, as Ron mentioned and others already, John was a, a great natural leader. And he's, this skill he demonstrated from the very beginning in our days in the fraternity house when he was the coach and leader of our, of our many sports teams. Uh, and his method for, for motivating us and getting us out of bed and get ready to play was legendary. He would play Van Halen in, out of his, uh, most, the most powerful stereo in the fraternity house at volume level 11. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Spinal tap. But it was extremely, it was a brilliant scheme, and it was extremely effective. We were always the, always the first on the field. We were always ready to play. I'm not sure about the guys who... who weren't on the team, but in any case, it was a it, it was a great leadership skill, and he was and his, these leadership skills were effective throughout his entire life, as 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 Ron and Bob have mentioned too. That that he he really was a, a, an amazing leader, and and uh, it, it in in business in the Rotary Club, uh, organizing golf tournaments, he was a natural leader, and I learned I learned a lot from him. I'm very grateful for that. The other area where he had a lot of influence on me, involved our common passion for golf. Early on, I was a young, hot-blooded, club-throwing volcano on the golf course. Um, and and I, I could mention the story that, uh, that, he, he, that he, he named my, go- my putter Amelia. And why? Because it had more air time than Amelia Earhart. But, but early on, John calmed me down and, and, and showed me that I, how, how I could enjoy the game without constantly being angry and taught me how to control my emotions and, and really enjoy the game. And I'm very, very, very grateful for that. 
One story I remember years ago, I was working at Disneyland, and, and John asked me to, to play in a charity golf tournament. Actually, it was out here in Westlake. Unfortunately, Mr. Disney scheduled me to work all night the night before the tournament uh, at a grad night, and so I got off work at uh, sunrise, drove like crazy out, out to here, uh, walked straight onto the tee from the parking lot, teed off without, without any sleep. I played the first hole awful, terrible. And I'll always remember what John said to me he, he, to encourage me. He says, don't worry about it. It's, it's just a walk in the park. And, and, it, and it's simple words, but I'll tell you, that really uh, struck home with me, not just then, but, but many times since. USC is uh, with their backs against the wall. The, the Trojans are with their backs against the wall, and uh, the time's running out, and it's fourth down, and the, the crowd is going crazy. And I just look over at John, and, I, and he says, just a walk in the park. He had such a great ability to calm me down and everyone else. He had fantastic abilities. And back to that golf day, uh, with those words, I played great that day. So did John. John played great, and we wound up winning the tournament. He had fantastic ability in those areas. I think I played uh, more golf with John. uh, uh, I was trying to figure out exactly how many holes, maybe 6,000 holes with John. And and I'm so grateful for that opportunity uh, to, to learn from him, not just about golf, but about life and how to be a better person. John also had a great ability to span generations. My father uh, considered John one of his closest friends. My dad couldn't be here today. He's recovering from uh, hip surgery, but he did want me to say, he wanted me to speak for him in in remembrance of John. John was always very good to my dad and uh, always had a lot of time for my dad. Uh, even go, even in the 80s, he shared his Rams season football tickets with my dad and I when the Rams were playing in Anaheim. So for 12 years, we every every Sunday home game, we, we spent a lot of time with John watching the Rams play. Of course, as, as, as everybody's discussed here, John was such a sports fan and loved all sports. So in closing, I'll, I'll make this brief. I, I know this is a difficult day, especially for John's family. John left us too soon. However, knowing John was a man of faith, I have confidence he's in heaven now with Jesus in a place that's greater than all understanding. And this is not goodbye, as I plan to see John again in heaven. And that gives me comfort, and I hope comfort for everyone here today. God bless you, John. Okay, um, I've, I've been asked to ask that all the Phi Kappa Tau brothers of John Newhouse please come up to the front here and we're going to have a brief ceremony uh, of, uh, for, for, the, for John uh, based upon some of the rituals of our fraternity. Uh, Rick Rice and Mark Perrow will, will lead, the, lead the ceremony, and, we'll, and this will be uh, fairly brief. Good afternoon. We'd like to now uh, perform the uh, Phi Top funeral service and then followed by the Brotherhood song. We've assembled here to offer the last tribute of love and honor to our brother who has passed at the great beyond. The silver cord is loosed. The golden bowl is broken. The pitcher is broken at the fountain. The wheel is broken at the cistern. And the spirit returneth unto God who gave it. We mourn the breaking of these earthly ties and the loss of companionship. Another link has been broken, severed in the fraternal chain which binds us together. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved... We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. To our sorrowing relatives and friends, we offer our deepest sympathy in the hour of bereavement and loss. The God of our fathers, whose name is everlasting, will be our God forever and forever. This red carnation emblem we now give to our brother's family. By it, we were reminded by the fragrance and charm of our brother's life. It is symbolic in the fondest hope that the flower shall bloom again in the eternal spring. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Amen. Amen. We are brothers now and ever. Until the day we die, and when that time comes rolling round, and we bid our last goodbyes, there is one thing sure and certain, 
to shift our thoughts for a moment to the words penned by John Newton, a former slave trader turned pastor. Let's listen.
And this is something about my dad. He never looked for praises. He was never one to boast. He just went on quietly working for the ones he loved the most. His dreams were seldom spoken. His wants were very few. And most of the time his worries went unspoken to. He was there, a firm foundation through all of our storms of life, a sturdy hand to hold on in times of stress and strife. A true friend we could use to turn to when times were good or bad. One of our greatest blessings, the man we called Dad. Love, love you, Dad. Two scriptures today, Psalm 126, 5 through 6. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. And from Matthew 5, verses 3 through 16. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Hi, how's everybody doing? Um, my name's Scott. For those of you that don't know me, I'm one of John's two very proud sons. Um, so just a couple weeks before he had his stroke at the end of May, he and I actually had the chance to meet up in Omaha, Nebraska, and we got to see Warren Buffett's annual meeting at his company's headquarters. For those of you unfamiliar, Warren Buffett has a big following, and there's probably around thirty to 40,000 people that packed into Omaha just to listen to what he had to say. And so Warren was asked a question about his diet, which includes lots of ice cream and, and cherry, uh, cherry Cokes, five Cherry Cokes a day. Uh, and, and Warren said, you know, if you told me that I could live one year longer if I'd eat nothing but broccoli, or all my life I could eat whatever I want, I'd rather eat my way than live another year. Once Warren said that, my dad cheered louder than I have ever heard him cheer before. And I kid you not. Um, yeah, I love that story because it really captures my dad's views on life. Uh, he knew how precious life was, and he wanted to enjoy it properly, and he wanted to enjoy it his way. Uh, he didn't want to wait till the end of his life to start living his life. And this is the kind of philosophy that guided his life, to seek out what makes you happy because tomorrow's not a given. Uh, as, as we've heard uh, from Kevin and Bob, you know, he's traveled to 49 out of 50 states, over 30 countries, a backpacking trip right after college with Randy, and then he went on another one some years later. He's been to Australia for, I think, a month with my mom and brother, Japan for the same amount of time on a different trip. Dad always found time to do things that he loved with those that he loved. 
when we were watching Pete Carroll's run at USC, we knew we were watching something special, and we made trips to the Orange Bowl and to the Rose Bowl when they were playing in there. With my brother, uh, they shared a love of Star Trek, and they went to conventions wherever they were. And I know a lot of you um, been to USC games and Dodger games and other fun events with my dad. He was always up for a trip, a game, or an adventure. Uh, but beyond the fun that he had enjoying life, his proudest accomplishment really was his family. Uh, he, along with my mother, raised two reasonably mature and, and very independent grown men. Uh, and most, import- most importantly to him, he met the love of his life, Wendy, my mom, and cherished his time with her every day. In almost every way you can imagine, my dad lived a fulfilling, thriving life. But even still, despite this full life, it's hard, no, it's impossible to not feel the pain of his death. Uh, to feel like something's been taken away from us, something that we won't be able to replace. We'll never be able to travel with him again. We'll never be able to laugh with him again, go to Dodger games with him again, or tailgate with him at USC games again, or never plan and play in golf tournaments again. And as I've thought about this over the last few weeks, it's that neverness that's probably the most painful. And I started thinking, do we have to have this suffering? Is there a way we could avoid this suffering somehow? And I think there is. And I'll come back to this point in a second, but I think that path of avoiding suffering, it's not pretty, and I don't think we want to follow it. You know, as, we go through li- as we go through life, we really need contrast to help us you know, understand and appreciate and thrive in life. So we need to have darkness to have light. We need to feel pain to help us know what to avoid. You know that instant pain when you put your hand in some boiling hot water? That pain tells us, don't do that again. And so we need that. Or we can take a virtue like courage. You know, we value courage in this life because we know that there's danger in the world. And so if we didn't have danger, we have to be courageous because we know that there is danger in the world. And so if we didn't have danger, then we won't have that virtue like courage. And so these contrasts in life are really important. And sadly, it's the same way with love and suffering. As soon as we enter into loving relationships in this world, we open ourselves up to pain, suffering, and loss. Now, as I said before, we could avoid this suffering, but we'd have to do it by not loving much. If we don't love much, we would feel much less pain. But a loveless life isn't a life worthy of living. And so here we are crying and lamenting and grieving because we opened ourselves up to the certainty that at some point in the future, at some point in our lives, we were going to suffer because of our love. Because there is no love without suffering. And they come hand in hand and we can't have one without the other. And so this pain that we feel right now and that we felt for the last few weeks, it's, it's a direct connection to the love that we had to John, for John. Now I want to go back to the wise words of Warren Buffett, who Dad and I both loved. And he routinely says, and I quote, I measure success by how many people love me. I measure success by how many people love me. And Dad, given the outpouring of love that we've felt over the last few weeks, as well as what we can see in this room today, it's it's just unbelievably clear that you were an extraordinary success. There's a funny story about a man that has a funeral, and the minister says, well, now's the time for someone to say something nice about the deceased, and no one comes forward. And then the minister says, surely someone can say something nice about the deceased. And finally, one man comes forward and he says, well, his brother was worse. (laughs) Luckily, thankfully, we do not have this problem with John. Uh, Again, we have been overwhelmed with people offering very gracious and very high praise for John. It would take all day to mention them. I just want to point out a couple, and please don't get mad at me if I neglected to mention what you've said. Um, But we have Evan, who was one of his former... uh, baseball uh, players. He said, John was my favorite coach of all time, and Evan even wrote a leadership essay about John. Evan's mother, Julie, said John was a mentor and a teacher and someone the whole team looked up to. Multiple friends of mine reached out to me to say that they still remember the times when we would go to Tommy's before the Dodger games and just what a blast that was with my dad. One friend, Janet, calls John a warm fantastic, loving human being. Daniel from 
Culver National, who knew Dad when he was at Culver National, said John was a true professional, well-respected by all, and a dedicated husband and father. His rotary friend Sarah said John loved life and was the embodiment of a good husband, father, friend, and amazing financial advisor. Another friend, a rotary friend, Michael, said that he never remembered John saying a bad word about anybody. Longtime friend Virgie knew him growing up, growing up, and called him the pride and joy of his parents, George and Helen Newhouse. And this one I get a real kick out of. Debbie and Maria, who both worked for him at the bank, called him a great boss. Now, I looked this up. Now, half of American workers have actually left a job just to get away from a boss at some point in their lives. So that they were calling him a great boss, I think that's an awesome compliment. And so and the next question I have is, so John lived a full life. He lived a successful life, a life where hundreds are literally mourning his loss and truly our loss. So where do we go from here now that his physical body has gone? And I know what we shouldn't do. We can't let our sadness paralyze us forever. And we can't hit, let his loss, and really our loss, become a roadblock from us living a fulfilling, successful life, just like he did. The only thing that would bother Dad more than not being here with us today is if we failed to live up to our potential because we were so upset, so harmed by his death. So we can't let that happen. But at the other end of the spectrum, we can't forget about John just to lessen our pain. We can't turn his pictures around to avoid seeing him. We can't avoid speaking his name, and we can't throw away all of his mementos. Now, Mom, we also can't keep all of his mementos. (laughs) We have to be able to go on living our best life while taking his spirit and his legacy with us as we go on this journey. Well, what is his legacy and his spirit? And I'm sure it's a lot of things to a lot of people, and I would sincerely love Uh, to hear others describe John's spirit to us in the reception after this. Uh, But for me, there's three things that come to my mind when I think of Dad's legacy and his spirit. First, it's to have an appreciation of those who came before us and a desire to help others achieve even greater heights. Some of you may know John was adopted by George and Helen Newhouse, and who knows how his life would have turned out if he hadn't been adopted by them. I know he felt incredibly lucky to have him as his parents. Grandfather George was at Culver National in the beginning days, uh, helping establish and grow the company. And when the time was right, my dad, stating on his dad's shoulders, he became president and helped grow and lead it even more until the time was right for him to exit that business and become a financial advisor. And in much the same way, frankly, I've followed my own dad's footsteps into the same profession, and I'll be able to stand on his shoulders the way he stood on the shoulders of his parents. But Dad didn't just seek out to help his own kids. He was a faithful baseball coach for well over a decade, with many former players calling him the best coach they've ever had. He was a steadfast member of the Rotary, regularly seeking out ways to help the group and the community by extension. John sought out ways to help others stand on his shoulders so that they could have a better life. And if we want to keep John's spirit and his legacy and bring some redemption to his death, I think we should all take some time to think and act about ways that we can help others achieve more, just like John did. Now, I want to share a little story. I'll connect it to my second point about Dad's spirits. But for those of you who don't know, um, after Dad had his stroke, the left side of his brain wasn't working, so the right side of his brain right side of his body wasn't working. And so uh, the, the day actually before he died, we had most of our family in his hospital room, and we're all hanging out with him, and I showed up a little late. So when everyone left, I stayed a little bit uh, after just to hang out with Dad some more. And the doctor wanted to sing with Dad, and the hope was, you know, if we could get Dad singing songs that he was familiar with, we could get, you know, the left side of his brain working, and, you know, maybe we can get that going, rev that up again, and the right side of his body would start working again, and... And the doctor, you know, wanted to try that. So the doctor starts singing some basic songs. You know, John, let's sing the ABCs. And he's able to do that. No problem. A, B, C, D, you know, just like that. Um, And I'm so sorry that you have to listen to me sing for just even a little bit. (laughs) 
so after we do the ABCs, we did uh, row your boat. Uh, again, you know, we've been hearing that since we were little kids, and Dad was able to nail all the words. And so the doctor looks at me, and, and he's a, frankly, he's a little excited. Um, and he says, Scott, do you know any songs that Dad would remember uh, that you could sing with him? Now, uh, given that I'm also a proud USC alum, I knew exactly which song we were going to sing. <laughs> and so the day before he died, he and I sang uh, the USC fight song, and he nailed every word. It, now, I knew this was a really special moment. I didn't know he was going to die. He really was getting better, but, you know, I, I knew it was a special moment, even though I didn't know it was our last time together. It, but my point, my second point about John is, it's easy for us to appreciate those special moments because we kind of know, but it's, it's harder for us to appreciate the simple, routine, familiar things in life to not appreciate the beauty that we see around us every day or to not treasure the relationships that we have enough. But that wasn't the case with John. And with my mom, he knew how lucky he was. And let me tell you a little bit story, a little story about dad appreciating those everyday things with mom. Dad worked at home. He had a home office right next to his bedroom. So he would wake up, he'd go into the office and get started with his day and mom would go make some coffee. And... Mom would bring him the coffee when it was done and say, you know, John, do you need anything else? And he would say, just a kiss. Every time she asked that question, is there anything else you need? Just a kiss. It could have been, it would have been really easy to say, no, I'm okay. After all, he heard this question every single day. But dad didn't take those simple routine moments for granted. And I think that's a lesson all of us can take with us as we think about Dad's spirit and his legacy. Now, my third and last point that I want to talk about from Dad is to seek out those that you love and cherish them deeply and to let them know how much you love them. Every time I would come home to visit, when I asked him, hey, Dad, how are you doing? He would say genuinely, good, now that you're here. With my brother, he would routinely tell me and anyone who would listen how proud he was of John. In fact, and you're going to have to forgive me for bringing this up, but the only time I heard Dad lament, or the only time I remember Dad saying he wasn't exactly proud of John was one time he went to go visit him in San Diego and he couldn't believe how messy John's room was. (laughs) But that was it. And I'm thinking, you know, when that's the only potential bad thing that you could say about a son, you've done a pretty good job. Uh, and again, there's my mom, Wendy, who dad loved immense, immensely. She was the perfect yin to his yang. The Bruin to his Trojan. They were a wonderful example of what a marriage should look like. And dad loved her deeply. And most importantly, he, most importantly, he was not shy in expressing it. And that's important because to love someone but not express it fully, it's to diminish the power that love brings. And so in the last couple of weeks as we were getting ready for this, I was looking through Dad's computer, looking at pictures, reliving old memories. And I came across something he'd written at the, uh, for a speech at the Rotary a couple years ago. And here's what dad had to say about mom. Wendy is the love of my life. My inspiration that has stood side by side with me for over 30 years. She's a wonderful mother to our two boys who have turned out to be two outstanding young men. She's a caring, loving person that puts the needs of those around her before her. Wendy has supported me through all of life's celebrations and challenges. And I could not imagine where I would be. (laughs) I could not imagine where I would be without her. (laughs) 
Mom calls dad a romantic. Sorry about that. And it's hard to deny that, especially after reading that. But even if you, you yourself aren't a romantic, we can still carry a really important lesson that dad taught us. Cherish the ones that you love and express that frequently. Now God, through Jesus, suffered in death as well. And his disciples faced the same pain that we feel at John's death. Jesus wasn't going to be, res- excuse me, Jesus was not going to be resuscitated. Resurrected, yes. But resuscitated, no. And the same is true of John. But in the aftermath of loss, there isn't just grief. There's also opportunity. As one Christian philosopher said, in the valley of suffering, despair and bitterness, they are brewed there, but there also is character made. The valley of suffering is the veil of soul making. And so in the disciples' moment of suffering, they made a choice. They made a choice not to forget the life of Jesus. They made a choice to avoid cheap or easy answers about death and suffering. You know, death and the neverness that it brings that I spoke about earlier. It's complicated and it's heart-wrenching. And it's truly a mystery in my mind. But in the aftermath of Jesus' death, the disciples made a choice to turn their suffering into something redemptive. They made a choice to embrace the character-making opportunity that suffering does bring and better themselves because of it. Now, we can do the same thing starting today for the rest of our lives. Don't let this paralyze you. Dad would hate that. But also, don't forget, John. Instead, let's embody his spirit and the light that he brought this world. To honor John, let your light shine by helping others so that they can stand on your shoulders. To honor John, let your light shine by appreciating the ordinary joys of life that we may have become numb to. To honor John, let your light shine by cherishing the ones that we love, regularly reminding them that we love them. If we do these things, then the tears that we'll cry, the anguish that we feel, the suffering we're experiencing, it won't be in vain. And John's death won't be the end of his spirit and his legacy. It will just be the beginning. Amen. Thank you.
When I am on your shoulders, you raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me God, whom generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived this life of faith, live now in eternity with you. Especially, God, we thank you for John Newhouse. We praise you for the gift of his life, for all in him that was good and kind and faithful, and for the grace that you have given him. We thank you for all the wonderful memories, for all the wonderful experiences that each of us has had with John. We thank you for his kind heart, the ways in which he touched our lives, as we will not forget, but will treasure these memories as gifts. We thank you for the things that have been shared here in celebration of his life from his friends and his family, for his humility for his compassion. We thank you for the thousands of lives that John has touched through coaching, through his work with the Rotary, for all the people that benefited far beyond this place and people that are just here today, that his work has gone on to benefit the underserved as well. And so, God, we lift up to you those that are left behind, those who are grieving his loss, those who have experienced the hole in their heart left by his passing. We lift up to you John's family and his friends, particularly Wendy and Scott and John Jr. Wrap them in your loving arms. Comfort them with a peace that surpasses all understanding and with assurances that John is with you and is at peace. Comfort the grieving with the strength to endure. But like Scott said, with the courage to live life to the fullest as a gift. We know for John that his pain and suffering are no more, that tears are no more, that he's now entered into the joy that you have prepared for him before the foundation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So here are the instructions.
One is an invitation. We're going to leave from here. We're going to go across the courtyard to the fellowship center and carry on the conversation. Now, I got a couple of rules. For every story you tell, you must listen to a story. <laughs> because if there are no listeners, there are no tellers. Secondly, Pastor Douglas and I are going to escort the family out and across while you are going to be here and listen to the USC, whatever it is. It's a fight song. It's something not good for church. For those of you who are UCLA fans, just suck it up. So you stand for the benediction. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of saints, the Holy Spirit which sustains us and empowers us, be with you and go with you both now and forevermore. Amen.
or a chip, and here's why. Bitterness keeps you from flying. Always stay humble and kind. Know the difference between sleeping with someone and sleeping with someone you love. I love you. It's hot.